Today is the second Sunday of Advent. As we get ready for the birth of Jesus, we're looking at uh, four passages from the Gospel of Isaiah, uh, things that ask questions or look forward to something. And then we're going to look at four passages from the Gospel of John. We're looking at these side by side, one from Isaiah, one from John, each Sunday. That these uh, from the Gospel of John are all things that Jesus said, and they answer the questions or they fulfill the things Isaiah was looking forward to. So one of the things that's highlighted throughout this uh, Advent season is that the birth of Jesus is in actuality the first step on his journey to the cross. And the cross is God's solution to our biggest problem, that is sin. So that's where we're going to begin here as we're looking at Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 39, up 1 through 39, if there's a lot of judgment. Isaiah is bringing God's words of judgment down on the people. And then in chapter 40, we get a change in the tone. Your God says, comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Her sins are pardoned. The, this is the same kind of language that was used in the ancient world to talk about someone who had been drafted into the military or drafted into forced labor, and now their service is finished. They've actually, we're told, served twice as long as what was required by the terms of their conscription. The Hebrew word here is ratza, and it means that God's attitude towards the people has shifted it's shifted from one of judgment to one of favor. So God says through Isaiah, listen. It's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wastelands for our God. Fill the valleys, level the mountains and hills, straighten the curves, smooth out those rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be, will be revealed and all people will see it together, the Lord has spoken. All four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, look back at this passage and use it to talk about John the Baptist. That John the Baptist was that person who came saying to the people, make straight the path for the Lord. Level those mountains and hills, fill that valley. Prepare the way for the Lord is coming. However, Isaiah and the people listening to him speak lived more than 500 years before John the Baptist was born. So that's not their frame of reference. Their frame of reference would be, when they heard this, would to be looked back to the exodus from Egypt. When Moses led the people out of slavery, and he was supposed to lead them into the promised land. But when they got to the promised land, they got scared, and they turned around and they spent 40 years wandering aimlessly through the desert. And so now Isaiah is saying, all that aimless wandering happened because you didn't trust God and you didn't follow God to where he was leading you. So you just walked in this random pattern all over the wilderness. Now is the time to make a straight path, a level path, an easy walking road for the Lord to come. Only this time, we need to follow where God leads. We need to go to the place where he goes. With Moses, it was a literal place. They were going to the promised land. But the people now are in that land, in that promised land. And so now it's a, a figurative place, or, or we could say a spiritual promised land that they're being called to follow God to. A voice said, shout. I asked, what should I shout? That's Isaiah asking that. This sounds a lot like Isaiah 6, where he is first called into service as a prophet. 
God says, shout that people are like grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers, the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Isaiah is contrasting a key difference between people and God, between the creation and the creator. People, like grass and flowers, are temporary and weak, part of the creation. God is permanent and strong, the one who did the creating. When God tells Isaiah to tell the people that the word of God stands forever, he's not talking about the Bible. For one thing, the Bible didn't exist yet uh, as a book when Isaiah is speaking. He's talking about the things that God has said. The immediate context, as I started with in Isaiah's chapter 1 through 39, is a word of judgment that the people are under God's judgment and that this judgment stands forever. The only way the judgment can be removed is if God speaks a new word, a word of comfort, a word of forgiveness. And that's where Isaiah is going with this. He says, O Zion, Zion is Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, the capital, the holy city, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops, shout it louder, O Jerusalem, shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. There's an amazing contrast here. If we slow it down and we look at it, we've got to slow down to see the contrast here. We can't go rushing to the next passage. Because we've got to look back a few verses here in Isaiah. We look back to him talking about the people being punished, where we started this reading, the beginning of chapter 40. But here, it says God is bringing not this word of judgment, but a reward. The, the Hebrew word here is pula. It's sometimes translated as, as recompense. And it means to pay damages uh, or make amends with someone who has suffered harm. So Isaiah is telling the people that God is going to pay them a visit and he's going to come and visit them in power, but that power is not the power of judgment. It's the power of making amends to repair their damaged relationship. Now, to be clear, the relationship is damaged because of the people, not because of God. But God is coming to repair the damage. When God comes to make things right, he will be like a shepherd, protecting a, lamb, a, a baby lamb or leading a mother and her young to safety. Now, to see what Isaiah is looking forward to, to see what Isaiah is talking about. Here, we jump to John chapter 10, where Jesus is, is traveling and speaking to both the crowds. In fact, it, it's his last sort of public discourse. So he's speaking to the crowds and his disciples there. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief or a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he's gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. Now, I have very little experience with sheep, and I'm guessing most of you have very little experience with sheep. But my one experience, 
personal experience, personal interaction with sheep was I lived in the woods in central Minnesota. And I came home from work one day, and there was about a half a dozen sheep wandering around in my yard, which was very strange because I live in the woods. I don't live out in the countryside. And I had never seen uh, any of my neighbors having sheep in their yards. So I made a few phone calls, and I eventually found out that, that someone who lived not far away from me, sort of, we, we had our backyards abutted each other, but the backyards were the woods, so we didn't see each other, we didn't know each other, but I found out he had bought these sheep the day before and had penned them up, and they had escaped from their pen during the day. So eventually he was able to get home from work and then he came over and we spent the rest of that evening trying to catch those sheep and put them in his trailer. We chased them all over my yard because we had a problem. They didn't know me. They didn't know my voice. They didn't try. I made them nervous. And he had just bought them the day before, so they didn't know him. It would have been much easier if they had been his sheep for, you know, all their lives. Of course, if they had been his sheep all their lives, they wouldn't have gotten away. They got away because they were in a new pen they didn't recognize. They were trying to get back to the farm where they came from, which was, I don't know where they were brought there by uh, in a trailer. The sheep didn't know me. They didn't know my voice. They didn't know my neighbor. They didn't know his voice. So they wouldn't follow us. They didn't know that we were trying to protect them and keep them safe because there were a lot of coyotes in that neighborhood. And there's a really good chance at least some of those sheep wouldn't have made it through the night. Now, in contrast, I was at a, a fair a couple of years ago. And I had my kids with me when they were younger. And there was a little kid there. He was, I, he was probably seven or eight. And he was showing a sheep at the fair, 4-H stuff. And he saw my, my kids looking at him. And he's like, hey, you want to come over and see my sheep? And they're like, yeah. And, and he just grabs this sheep, hauls it up, and puts it over the fence and sets it down so my kids could pet it. And then I saw that sheep followed him everywhere. That sheep totally trusted that little kid. The sheep had known that little boy all its life. And that little boy had kept him safe and had fed him. And had carried him around as a little lamb. So he trusted, he followed him everywhere. Now Jesus is talking to both his disciples. He's directing this to his disciples, but the crowds are listening. And they don't understand what Jesus is talking about. They don't understand that he is the shepherd that they are to trust. That's what it says. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep didn't listen to them. Yeah, Jesus is mixing up his illustrations. He's the shepherd, he's the gate, he's the gatekeeper, all these things. He, but he's trying to make a point here. Bottom line is that he protects his sheep and they know it. He will not lead them in the wrong direction. He will not take them into danger. What Jesus says about those who came before him has some, some real grim reality if we just look back a little bit, look back a couple of verses. In chapter uh, 39, we have a story about a man, or in chapter 9 of John, rather, in chapter 9, we have a story about a man who was born blind and Jesus healed him. And then the man got kicked out of the synagogue, out of their church, for, for thanking God for sending Jesus to heal him. He said to those, the people interviewing, the religious authorities, he says, I don't know, I, you know, I'm just a guy, but I can't believe he's not sent from, from God. 
that he does such wonderful things. And they threw him out. They kicked him out of the, out of the synagogue, out of the church. So think about that. Uh, what kind of shepherd kicks out one of his sheep because another person helped it? It would be bizarre if, when that, if my neighbor came over to get his sheep out of my yard and my neighbor's like, no, nope, no, nope, you, they're your sheep now. You took care of them. They can't, I, they can't, they're not welcome back at my house. That would be just bizarre. But that's essentially, that's what these religious authorities did. They said, you know, Jesus helped you. You can't be one of us. You, you think God sent him? You can't, you can't even come into our building anymore. Those are the men who are robbers and thieves that Jesus was talking about. And he goes on, yes, I'm the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They'll come and go freely and will find good pasture. The thief's purpose, those religious authorities back in chapter 9, their purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them, my sheep, a rich and satisfying life. So those local religious leaders were effectively trying to kill or spiritually kill the man that Jesus healed. He didn't fit in with their nice, uh, neat world that they had constructed, a world that they had constructed for their own advantage. So they kicked him out. In contrast, when Jesus healed him, it was to give him a rich and satisfying life. Now, Jesus here makes these I am statements. He, he did that from time to time. They're all related to Moses. When Moses was talking to the burning bush, he asked the burning bush who's talking to him, which is God speaking through the flames. He said, if I go back to Egypt and I lead the people out of slavery, who do I say is sending me? They'll want to know what my authority is. To which God said, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me. So Jesus would, would make reference to that statement from time to time about his identity. He said, uh, you know, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am the gate. Each of these helps us have a, a, a more full picture, a deeper picture, a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. And he goes on with this, with this statement of, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run, a, run when he sees a wolf coming. He'll abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's only in it for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. It's not necessarily a bad thing. What he's saying, though, is it's just a job to them. We've gone from, I'm the gate who will protect people and give them good pasture and give them a, a, a full and meaningful life to now I'm the good shepherd and I'm going to die to protect my sheep. This illusion of, of, of death or, the, uh, or this sort of talking about death, it's going to become more and more common the closer Jesus gets to the actual cross. Notice the sentence. So, the hired hand runs away because he's only working for the money. They're just a hired hand. It's just a job. If their sheep get killed, they'll go find another job. But the shepherd, the sheep are his life and his livelihood. Their protection is paramount to him. Their life and his life are, are intertwined. He says it again, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep. They know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too. They're not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. 
I have other sheep. Sounds strange, but when you look at what's coming up later in the Bible, it's not so strange. He, he's talking about those people who are outside of, of Israel, who are not Jewish at that time, and he's also talking about the people who will come later. So in that essence, when he says, I have other people, he's talking about us, you and me. But the immediate context is the Gentiles. That's what Jewish people call people who aren't Jewish. And we see that in the book of Acts and in the writings of, of Paul, especially about the Gentiles, the non-Jews, becoming part of the church. The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down and when I want, when I want to, and also to take it back up. For this is what my Father has commanded. These analogies of the death, of Jesus' death and of the cross, they're just going to come now one after another. And once again, we see that during Advent, this time as we pre prepare for the birth of Jesus, that we are actually preparing for Good Friday. That Jesus' birth leads inevitably to the cross. So he says, I came to do this. Last week I talked about the incarnation. That's this, this belief that Jesus is both fully human and fully God. Not divine, but actually God. And in coming to earth, Jesus fulfilled God's promise that God would come in power and bring his reward with him when he came. That he would that he would repair the damage of our relationship with him. Even though we cause the damage, he brings the repair. And that he would feed his flock like a shepherd and carry the lambs close to his heart. And so, as we end this sermon on our second Sunday of Advent, we go to another passage to end with from the Old Testament, from Zechariah where he says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come, and I will dwell in the midst, declares the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, give us, give us voices to sing. Give us hearts of rejoice as we prepare for Emmanuel, for God with us, for the birth of Jesus as he comes to repair the damage between our relationship, to lead us, to shepherd us, and to protect us. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.